Welcome everyone to 2021's first Drinks and Dress. Now I'd like to introduce our guest today, Larry McQueen, who is a respected Hollywood costume historian and archivist. Um, he's held the position of consultant for Camden House Auctioneers in Los Angeles, Christie's, New York, Christie's, London, Butterfield and Butterfield in Los Angeles and San Francisco. Um, he's been responsible for the authentication of film costumes and the estimation of their value. Uh, from 1999 to, until 2012, uh, McQueen worked as an archivist with MGM and United Artists in creating and maintaining a prop and costume collection of the MGM films. The collection has worked with private estates and costume houses such as Lucille Ball, Jane Withers, Edith Head, Wayne Finkelman, Julie Newmore, Deb Newmar, Debbie Reynolds, and Western Costume Company, Eastern Com Costume Company, CRC, American Costume, and others. Mr. Queen's private collection of film costumes is one of the finest collections of its kind and consists of costumes worn in films from the 1920s to the present. Um, he has exhibited portions of his collection in association with the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, the Met, LACMA, the VNA, FIT, and the American Film Institute, and many, many others, which I won't go into great detail about. Larry, welcome to Drinks and Dress. We're so excited to have you here, and it's so fantastic hey. to see you in our hometown of Los Angeles. So, yeah. well, um, thanks. It's 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 wonderful to. Uh, be able to share uh, some of the things that we've done and and why we do it. Excellent. Um, I know that you have some things prepared, so why don't we just dive right in, um, and uh, we may have some questions along the way. So if you want okay. to start out with, uh, you know, the collection and its background, so go forth. Okay. Uh, um... It's 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 difficult to try to put into a, a quick PowerPoint uh, what and why the the collection has done what it's done. It's been 35 years of work. Uh, there were tiny little steps. There were huge steps. There were good times. There were bad times. Major accomplishments and major mistakes. But uh, uh, I'll try to make a go of it. I'll try to be as quick as possible. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that. Probably, uh, I, it would be impossible to discuss uh, the collection without beginning uh, by mentioning Bill Thomas, uh, not the costume designer of the same name, but uh, because without him, uh, I wouldn't be where I am today. Uh, we met around oh, 1980 in an establishment to show old movies and Busby Berkeley clips and film documents. and. Uh, we instantly fell into discussions about old movies and Hollywood. And as we ran into each other from time to time, we again fell into those same discussions. And I discovered that Bill was a member, a junior member of the Hollywood Robin Hoods. And for those of that don't know, they were a group of collectors that were working with Debbie Reynolds in, in uh, her efforts to preserve as much of the whole old Hollywood memorabilia that she could that was being discarded by the studios. Uh, in the old days, the studios uh, created everything uh, and had huge wardrobe departments who created every costume that were worn in the films. But uh, as the studio system started to falter in the 60s, it was, it was just becoming too expensive to keep these departments and the huge stock of costumes. And by the 1970s, the executives decided to sell off the assets and uh, attempt to balance the books and sell off all the back lots to real estate developers. Uh, different studios went about it in different ways. Uh, MGM and Fox had auctions. Uh, sometimes they were selling individual costumes, sometimes they were selling costumes by the rack and sometimes by the pound and, and even sometimes by the room full. Uh, some studios just resorted to dumping them in landfill or uh, burning them. Uh, Debbie, who was a product of the old system herself, uh, wanted to save it. Uh, during this time, uh, occasionally I would assist Bill in live fashion shows that he would do using Hollywood costumes. I mean, sometimes I would model one. Uh, I'm the guy in the lion suit from The Wiz in the background there. 
Uh, but more likely, I assisted backstage to uh, assure that the overzealous models didn't damage the costumes. Uh, I was in one such uh, fashion show that a model stepped on the train of the dress in front of her, and the entire back of the dress tore off at the waist. And this was when, uh, well, this was a defining moment for Bill and my, myself when I, we realized that these pieces should not be worn again by live models. I mean, as wonderful it was to see them move like they were designed to do, um, it just wasn't worth the damage that could occur. Uh, as I started to see costumes, I, I, I wanted to get involved with Bill's Robin Hoods, and, and his answer was always a very stern, no, you don't. Uh, by the <laughs> mid-1980s, uh, I discovered that Bill was having issues working with the group because they were splitting into factions, uh, some with only the intent to make money, and uh, some turning on each other to acquire the best pieces, and they were starting to become overly brazen in their attempts to acquire them. Um, <laughs> Bill didn't like what he was seeing in the group, and he didn't like what he was seeing in, in himself. Uh, in uh, 1984, Bill told me my greed for these things are, is destroying my love for them. And uh, so he sold his personal collection in New York, uh, intent never to collect again. Uh, but about the same time, uh, new auction companies started to pop up, realizing there was a profit to be made in moving memorabilia. Uh, but they needed somebody to inventory, authenticate, and set up exhibitions, and Bill was recruited. And at the same time, I was working in a law firm as an archivist. I had access to a computer. I knew how to type, and I had an advanced degree in technical theater. So Bill asked me if I would join him in this adventure. And it was in 1989, and that was a year that changed my life. But, uh, it wasn't all glamorous work. <laughs> it was grueling, dirty work. But uh, it was also very, very exciting because we were creating something new, trying to show these pieces in a way that would reflect how important we thought they were. Uh, as time went on, our reputation grew and, and uh, we started working for other auction companies and studios and costume houses, most not notably Christie's in 1989 for the auction of Paramount Star Collection. And then, then later in 1991 to 1994 for Butterfields and Butterfields in auctioning the Western uh, Costume Company Star Collection. I mean, thousands of pieces started passing through our hands, and, and Bill would mentor me on the subtleties of construction from the studio to studio, or from designer to designer, and the importance of condition. I mean, with our each individual talents, we started to become uh, a very good team and, and, and best friends. Uh, we all start, so also started working with Southern, Southern uh, secondhand clothing stores that were starting to pop up. Uh, they had deals with the studios and production companies to disperse production wardrobe to the public as clothes. And in the process, we decided to pull some costumes back together that we thought were had some sort of historical significance. I mean, it was an incredible learning process to to process and put back together giant puzzles like this for Masters of the Universe and putting them into some sense of organization. Um, it, it was an amazing, amazing time. I, I, in, in our attempts to figure out how some of the complicated costumes went back together, I was usually the dummy uh, wearing these costumes. And, and like this from Masters of the Universe, uh, this particular costume had been in a warehouse for pro probably seven years. And in the process of trying to figure out how, uh, how it all went back together, I mean, I was covered with spider bites. Um, but uh, as we worked with more and more of the costumes, I became even more obsessed with purchasing something. And Bill uh, still had emotional scars uh, from his past, and he was the answer was always no. Um, but 1989, I think I broke him down because a uh, gown uh, that was worn by Greta Garbo and Queen Christina came up for auction, and we both wanted it, but neither one of us could afford it by ourselves. But if we bought it together, that would mean we were starting a collection. And so the collection of motion picture costume design was created. I mean, we had all the legal papers drawn up, and we did 
mission statements and vision statements, and most importantly, a code of morals and ethics to try to bring, bring back some sense of respect back to the concept of being a collector. Um, you know, but as a collection started to grow, we were aware that this industry that we were helping to create was going to turn around and bite us one day. I mean, the things were becoming more valuable. Uh, and with Planet Hollywood entering the market, and they started to buy pieces to display in their restaurants. And the more they paid for the pieces, the better publicity value uh, was uh, it was for them. So they would even bid against themselves to get a higher price so they could promote that this is what we're putting next to your tables. I mean, uh, we realized we might eventually be priced out as collectors came on board with deeper pockets. But we also hope that our our innocence and maybe our sincerity would keep us uh, ahead of the curve. Uh, we started to do small exhibitions in local venues around Los Angeles, most notably at the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising. And for the first time, we started to see our pieces up in display. Uh, but Bill had a secret that he was keeping very well hidden. Uh, he had contacted HIV and uh, from the time that I had met him, he had always said, I don't think I'm going to live past the age of 36. Now, I innocently chalked it up to being his obsession with James Dean, but uh, he was getting thinner and he was starting to lose energy. I mean, he would always show up for a project and he'd perform 100%, but then he would sleep for three days. And as conditions started to get work worse, uh, I was hit with the reality of what it meant. Uh, when Bill turned to me one day and said, you know, one day I'm not going to be here. You're going to have to make all these decisions yourself. Um, he started to become more reclusive, uh, leaving me to handle a lot of the day-to-day -day operations. And on February 5th, 1995, uh, the day we had scheduled our first meeting to negotiate our first international exhibition in Tokyo, uh, Bill passed away. Um, I was with him when he died. And he wanted that meeting to go on the following evening, regardless of what happened. I mean, it was Bill's, you know, idea that he wanted our business to continue, and and there was no time like the present to do it. Um, but that that was Bill Thomas. Um, uh, anyway, I, I did make that meeting, and the exhibit did hurt, uh, occur in October of that same year. Uh, I, again, it's a, it's a whole other story of the trauma and the insecurities and the, the doubts that I had about stepping into Bill's shoes. Uh, but I did continue working with auction houses and costume houses and, and even helped to create uh, an archive for a major studio. Uh, and I continued to acquire major pieces and mount exhibitions about the world. But I will forever be grateful for the good things that I learned from Bill and also the warning things of some of the bad things and how to avoid them. Uh, now I'll go into quickly a, a brief thing about the collection today uh, and, and uh, how we store things and take care of things. Uh, when we first started the collection, I mean, storage, well, storage has always been the largest problem we ever had. I mean, but as the collection grew, I mean, whatever space we could find, be it a spare bedroom in Bill's home or in my home or a friend's home, I mean, we would use it. And as it started to get larger, I had to rent storage units, which I do not approve of. Uh, uh, but with things spread all over the place, there was a lack of organiza organization and control. And so in 2006, I acquired a loft in Los Angeles and set up shelving, a workspace, and a display space. Uh, and for the first time, I could walk to a shelf and pull a box, and it was wonderful. <laughs> now, I've always thought that being a private collector, one of your main responsibilities was to take care of the things that you have so the damage doesn't happen while you're, being take, you're taking care of them. I mean, for the most part, all the costumes are boxed. Um, I mean, I can monitor and somewhat control the sudden change in to temperature and humidity. Uh, and as time and budget allowed, uh, pieces were packed in acid-free boxes, wrapped in acid-free tissue with, or with unbleached, unsized muslin, and uh, more recently in Tyvek. 
Uh, I mean, it's a never ending project. Uh, I learned how to do this from working with professionals who taught me how to do it. And I realized that I was certainly capable of doing it myself. But I have to admit that one of my biggest searches to find deals on acid free tissues and boxes, which is getting harder to do because a lot of those places are closing on the West Coast. And uh, so it's getting more expensive to ship them from the East Coast. Uh, I mean, since most of the costumes spend their lives in the boxes, uh, this is very important to assure that they're not being damaged when they're being stored. And when it comes to conservation or sometimes restoration, I, I do consult professionals. I mean, over the years, I've learned to do a lot of things, but I know my limitations. And there are some things that I just will not do and, and leave it to the professionals. I mean, this can get rather expensive. And so these projects must be well spaced and budgeted for. Uh, acquisition budget, budgets are often spent on conservation of what I already have. Uh, one of the biggest restoration projects uh, was for Melania Dietrich uh, in the Fabergé gown uh, from Angel. I mean, it's another long story. Uh, it took five years to complete. Uh, and I consulted archivists as what I shouldn't do, should do. Uh, and I finally designed, decided that instead of leaving it as a box of unshowable beads, that I was going to have it restored. I mean, it was a project of passion. Uh, one of my favorite things in working with these things are the people that I get to meet along the way in various different projects, because I learned so much from them. Uh, I started a project with uh, uh, Kathleen Lena, who is a jewelry historian and designer to recreate re re pieces of jewelry uh, worn with costumes in my collection. I mean, in the process uh, that each piece takes, well, it, it's a long but exciting story. I mean, I do not represent that these pieces of jewelry as being the original piece of jewelry, but they are faithful representation. And in the process of researching the piece, we often discover very interesting facts about the pieces, such as this 52 carat sapphire brooch worn by Carol Lombard in My Man Godfrey was real and her own. And she wore it in many films and uh, a whole lot of publicity, publicity photos. Um, now, I know, I know it's somewhat of a vanity project because, I mean, I could certainly destroy, you know, display these costumes without the pieces. Uh, but, you know, something ha magical happens when you put things back together again and, and, and it just feels right. Uh, I'd always intended to someday photograph all the pieces in the collection, but and I realized it would be a long and expensive project to keep a photographer on hand during the time it would take to pull, prepare, dress stage and shoot the pieces and then repack the pieces. So I finally decided to teach myself how to be a photographer. I mean, I purchased a decent camera, backdrops and lightings and, and with my Photograph for Dummies book, I started to push the buttons, turn the knob and push the button until I came up with a look that I, I liked. I mean, I photographed uh, all the pieces from the front, the side, the back, along with photographs of interesting details and her labeling. Um, Working by myself, it took two years, but it's probably one of the most worthwhile projects I think I've ever done. Uh, I mean, touching these garments I hadn't seen in years and in the process, revaluating them and in some cases, discovering things about them I didn't know. I mean, one case was that an unknown piece that I had no idea what it was turned out to be Marlena Dietrich from the Scarlet Empress. I mean, it was a wonderful find. <laughs> Treasures in uh, your own collection. Uh, the Loft Space uh, also afforded me a uh, space to do small to play, uh, displays for people interested in research or in uh, the preparation of an exhibition. And it gives me a chance just to play with the pieces that I very seldom get to do. Uh, it's completely uh, changed my relationship with the collection. And now I'll give you a very quick sort of run through of some of the costumes, some of them costumes that are in the collection and 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 so some of the thought processes that went uh, behind collecting them. Th this is the Greta Garbo Queen Christina. This is the dress that started it all. Um, we had known about the gown's existence for years uh, because it had sold in an auction many years before. Uh, and when we purchased it in New York and then it arrived in two 
boxes the size of mattresses. Um, and when we opened it, my, my first remark was, it's, it's a Egyptian slave labor. I mean, there's millions of beads and rhinestones, embroidered tile work, uh, uh, all ornamented on this 60 pound dress. Uh, it was an, it, uh, it is an amazing example of early Hollywood. Wow. Um, now we were timber de uh, determined to collect costumes that would focus more on the design and the time period uh, and, to, and to create a story about how Hollywood represented the historic time over the period of years. I mean, we knew, of course, that star names were important to assure that people would want to see them, uh, but it was more about the impact of the design on the film to create a character. I mean, and condition was always a major consideration because our goal was always to share these pieces with the public in exhibition, and they had to be strong enough to retain that uh, original magic and withstand the rigors of exhibition. Uh, if possible, we tried to collect suites of costumes from films to show the design concept for that particular film. We, we tried to collect not only the female costume from the film, but also the male costume from the film. Uh, I mean, and this it wasn't always a easy task because the costumes were hardly ever sold together. I mean, sometimes it would take years to pull the costumes together, but when they came up, we had to have them. And we also decided that we should collect contemporary costumes because today's contemporary costumes will be tomorrow's classics. And again, we tried to do the same thing and collect suites from the costumes, especially trying to get a male costume and then its corresponding female costume from the film. Uh, we wanted to collect costumes from various studios, various production dates, various designers, and film genres that represented the whole theme of costume design in Hollywood. I mean, Hollywood's representation of period costumes was not always historically accurate. I mean, as, as, a, colleague of, as, as a colleague of mine once coined the phrase, as she said, they are periodish. They have elements of the time period, but they usually have elements of the time that they were made. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Uh, in the 50s, uh, it brought a whole new style and sophistication to films because couture fashion designers started to design for films. Uh, Givenchy de designed almost all of Audrey Hepburn's war wardrobe for her films, but this did not always please the fashion designers or the, the films designers. And it wasn't always about the women's gowns. I mean, we decided to represent concepts of women in suits, women in pants, day dresses, and, and, and even lingerie. And we tried to collect pieces that would tell the story of how uh, a film could influence the current day fashions. I mean, after the 1974 version of The Great Gatsby uh, was released, um, elements of 1920s fashion started to appear on the catwalks, and there was a resurgence Uh, we also tried to assemble comparable samples of the way Hollywood over a period of time represented the same time period, such as the bias cut 1930s way of depicting Egyptian faction compared to the 1960s depiction of Egyptian fashion <laughs> in, which the gown, in which the gowns were more closely resembling a 1960s evening dress. We also wanted to represent how Hollywood paid very close attention to what was going on in the Paris Couture houses. I mean, even though this gown was designed by Charles Lemaire, it's obviously based on a Balenciaga gown. Or this Doris Day uh, costume, which was based on the 1949 Pierre Beaumont evening gown. Uh, Hollywood designers not only had to know what the current fashion trends were, but what the next fashion trends would be to assure that by the time the films came out, uh, they weren't already dated. But sometimes the film industry was caught by surprise when fashion silhouettes changed overnight, like with the Dior designs in the 1950s. Uh, and our guilty, our, our guilty passion was beaded gowns. I mean, <laughs> largely because they are the least likely to survive uh, using the heaviest materials, beads and stones, and attaching them to the sheerest 
silk illusions and chiffons. And it's one reason why so few of them exist. And whereas like silks and satins and lames could make a character jump out on the screen, nothing would depict sophistication and wealth or might make a higher impact on the screen than a solidly beaded gown. But they were also the most expensive. In 1936, when this gown was created for Angel for Dietrich, it was cost listed at $8,000, which would be $100,000 currency today. Yes. Um, they wow. became major investments for the studio, and they were often altered and used in multiple films. But it wasn't always about glitz and glamour. I mean, attempts were made to represent the down-to-earth uh, daily wear, such as the washed denim look with the white T-shirt. I mean, this look was as popular in the 1950s when the film was set as the 1970s when the film was made. I mean, in the 50s, it was a symbol of rock and roll and teenage revolt. And in the 70s, it represented the anti-war protesters, hippies, and women's rights. And sometimes they were collected just because they're fun. Uh, and make you laugh. Uh, we tried pulling together visuals that would appeal to people of all ages. Um, and we wanted to create a collection that was fun to look at, represent the designs of the many designers and performers as we could, that it had impact over the years. I mean, it's hard to kind of believe that 35 years have gone by so fast. And all of those individual decisions and the struggles that we made uh, uh, went through uh, bringing these pieces in one at a time was hard, but it was also very rewarding. I mean, I only hope that our vision of the story uh, we want to be told will someday be told. Larry, these are fantastic. And I, I mean, Thank you so much. So many of these that you've shown are from films that I've seen and some of my great favorites. I mean, I'm so glad that you're resting here on Barbara Streisand's Hello, Dolly. That's just, uh, I mean, it's a brilliant film. Brilliant film. Yeah. Um, it's that, really that I have to say is, 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 is one of the most recent ones that have come into the collection. And it was a, a long, arduous process to get that piece. Uh, and I wanted that piece because I also have the original sketches for that 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 piece. And and uh, we had original sketches for other pieces in Hello, Dolly, and we managed to acquire all the costumes except for that one. So when that one finally came home, it was like worth it. The whole set is done. Awesome. Excellent. So, OK, so I have some questions. Uh -huh. um, and I'm sure our audience has lots of questions. Um, <clears throat> and so um, I think um, I want to first of all ask you, like how when, when, when something comes up for auction, how do you decide whether you're going to go for it or not? And when do you know when your cutoff is? When do you say, no, that's too expensive for me? No, you, you never know when your cutoff part is. I mean, that's, that's the horrible thing about exit, uh, auctions. I mean, and I don't generally go to private auctions anymore because uh, I don't want to I don't want people to see the angst that I'm going through <laughs> as it's going on because it's usually one of total chaos and freaking out um, <laughs> but uh, luckily the collection is is fairly large now uh, and uh, uh, I no longer need filler pieces. Uh, I, ha I have a lot of filler pieces that will probably never see the light of day. Uh, so there are certain gaps in what things that I don't have. And, and, and when those pieces come up, I, I try to get them. Unfortunately, they're also some of the more expensive pieces, which makes it even harder to get. Indeed. But, um, uh, but you go for them, and sometimes you get them, and a lot of times you don't. I mean, that's, that's a frustrating yeah. thing about being a collector. I mean. I'm, I've discovered there are, th are times when I have like a piece that uh, is an accessory or or part of a costume that I have to have, and, and I have to have it because I have the rest of the costume, and those pieces always go for a ridiculous amount of money. So first question, um, 
let's see. Uh, do you track a note? Uh, do you track or note the other films a costume was used in? I do. Oh, and by the way, it's time to shake up a cocktail because we started to talk. Oh, <laughs> so yours I oh but I will too. Um, exactly. No, I, I mean, and it, it is always, I mean, I can't tell you how exciting it is when I'm watching a film and I see, when I see a costume that's in the collection walk by in the background, which is sometimes the only way it, it just walks by in the background. But sometimes it's worn by one of the leading characters and it's sort of like even more so, or not always the leading character, but the second leading character. And it's, it, it, is, it is so exciting and it happens all the time or I'll be looking through piles of photographs and it's like, wait a minute, that's, that's the dress. So no, it's, it's extremely exciting uh, to find Thanks. pieces that have been worn for again. And cheers, this is a, uh, we're celebrating with a brown derby. Cheers to you. Yes, and it's, it's not bad. I think I have a little more grapefruit juice than, uh, than I intended. I, well, I, I do too, but you know. <laughs> I had to use a great food app, you know. Um, uh, one of our uh, what, uh, one of our audience members has asked if you plan to publish a book. Uh, I mean, a lot of people have said that. Um, it's sort of strange because it, it's like what I do just sort of seems so second nature to me. And I don't think that, I mean, I know my personal friends for the majority of the time they have known me have have gone what do you do <laughs> you know? uh, and had no idea what i did uh, and had no interest in what i did um so uh i sort of kind of thought well no one's going to really care uh but there there are a lot of there are a lot of stories uh since i mean i wasn't i wasn't i wasn't in town i was still in high school thank you very much in the 70s when when uh, they sold off everything they sold the majority of the stuff from mgm and, and 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 Fox, but uh, I was here. I was here like in the '80s, and and there were still things being sold, and and there were things going on, and there were still people trying to preserve this stuff. Uh, and a, a lot of stuff happened. A lot of good stuff. A lot of bad stuff happened. Uh, yeah. So I mean, maybe people would find that interesting. But I, but uh, basically, I just sort of did what I did and did what I wanted to do and and with bill's help you know i managed to acquire the collection that we did um how large is your collection I, it's not people? it's not huge compared to like a lot of collections i mean it's it, it's uh it's only about 600 maybe 650 pieces which is not that large but those are pretty much ensembles so that, that and uh so it, it's it's a fair amount of pieces and it uh they are as far as i'm concerned they're uh good pieces uh they're pieces that tell a story and they're also pieces that are in a condition which still sort of retain the magic that you expect to see when you see a costume so um so even though it's not the largest collection i mean it's especially where with the demise of debbie reynolds now it's certainly one of the more larger collections that's out there do you have any pieces in your collection that you do not like? But you've collected because they round something out. Uh, <laughs> being, being a good parent, you try not to have favorites. Uh, but, you do, but you do. I mean, and you have favorites for various different reasons. Some of it's the journey and some of it's, you know, whatever. Um, there were there were there were times in the past uh, when you sort of get wrapped up in what's going on. Uh, I have a, a fairly substantial collection of 1970s, 80s beaded stage gowns worn by the likes of, you know, Petula Clark and Cher and, you know, a bunch of, those, you know, Diane Dion Warwick. I mean, and because they were available at the time and, and they were affordable at the time. And, and and there again, we had a thing for beaded gowns. So it was like, oh, we have to have it. Now, as time has gone on, I kind of realized that's not really what I do. That's not really what people expect me to have. And 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 uh so but my problem is I I I and largely because of the way the business was set up at the beginning with Bill, don't sell anything. Uh, right. because 
I don't want the collection to be about money. I want it to be about the history. That may be a stupid business model, but it's just something that's stuck in the head. And uh, and so I don't. Uh, and people say, I you know, really should let go of those those stage gowns and and possibly pay for another film gown that you will show. And so it's something that's bouncing on my head. So they're not, I don't, I don't dislike the pieces. I love the pieces and I photograph them and they're up, they're up on the website, but it's like, um, but I do realize they probably were a mistake. Doesn't or, mean I don't. It's, it's true. I love that. Um, speaking of funding, a couple of people have asked, um, so how do you fund your collection? Do you have, know. do you, do you have a sugar daddy somewhere or do you have um or <laughs> i'm a sugar daddy and i'm not a very sugar daddy so it, it's like everything from the beginning i mean people sort of think uh you know especially when they look at the size of the collection and the pieces we managed to collect over the years that we must have had a lot of money and and even when bill was alive neither one of us had a lot of money um uh, and and to pay for pieces, that's why we did a lot of those research projects for people, uh, to pay for it. I mean, and, and luckily, because we knew what pieces were coming up for auction, because we were working on those auctions, we decided, okay, we better save our money because we're going to want that piece. Sometimes you would get it, sometimes you wouldn't, but uh, we were at the right place at the right time. Okay. And, and But it was totally financed out of our pocket. Uh, and. Uh, like I said, those pockets weren't that big. When when I finally did, and not because I'm a huge Monroe fan, but I when I bought my Monroe, and this was after Bill passed away, the the Monroe that I have from someone like it hot, I mean, I spent two years paying that thing off. Uh, wow. It was not like I just clunked down the cash and did it. I mean, it was right. every piece that is bought is is paid for, and um, and. Uh, have no benefactors we have no supporters it's totally me myself and i so awesome. um, <laughs> it comes out of the pocket um another question from the audience for you larry is do you have a favorite era of hollywood to collect i do i i mean i like and some of it i think because it's my is because of my my because i mean i my theater background uh I like I like the I like the period costumes of the Renaissance and periods like that. I like them because they're just so big and voluminous and Guga and and Hollywood made them even more so. They're over uh, the top. So they're probably my favorite because they're. But I've I've started to sort of appreciate some of the subtler uh, things say even like 50s fashions i mean there's so many things that went on in fashion in the 50s and 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 trying to buy those pieces and pick those pieces and um so i i suppose yeah my favorite overall what i like to see when i go to a an exhibition is the big huge gowns but uh but also i like to learn the stories of those small subtle changes that happened in fashion and uh so yeah, I do, but I appreciate them all. Nice. Um, what do you have from the silent film era? There's only two pieces I have from it, and it, it was it was very sort of difficult to get silent pieces. And at one time, you couldn't find them at all because, I mean, that was if, if pieces from the 30s were difficult to find, the pieces for the 20s were even harder. Uh, largely because a lot of the pieces belonged to the people themselves that were the actors. Uh, the, I mean, a lot of times the people who got the best roles were the ones who had the biggest wardrobe. Um, but the only pieces that we have, uh, one is a prop. Uh, it's it's from a film uh, 1916 called Intolerance. And it's a uh, pectoral chest plate that a priest wore with the, I don't know how many tribes of Israel are on there. Uh, and that was uh, in the crucifixion of Christ scene. Uh, you see pro a priest in the background wearing it. Uh, that's the earliest piece. Uh, the only costume I have from the 20s is a 1920s costume uh, worn by Louise Glum in a film called Sex. And uh, it's a, a spider outfit with a spider web cape. 
which, by the way, I'm going to give a special shout out to Marcy Froelich, who is visiting yes. us today. Yes. Marcy is a friend of mine and who worked with you on the restoration of that dress. Um, yeah. So I'm giving a, a shout out to Marcy, who's in the audience. So um, thank you. Yes, she talked. She told me that story the other night, and I was like, "That's amazing." That is um, the thing. I, I mean, I really do because one of the things. I mean, I do work basically work by myself, and so when I do get to work with other people, it's it's sort of like a holiday because I'm. I mean, I love learning new things, and I love hearing people talk about their passion and 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 the things that they love uh, just because most of the time my friends won't listen to me talk about what I'm doing so if somebody is willing to listen I'll talk and uh, so and also I love learning new things I, I mean I over in the process of doing a lot of restorations and stuff I, I've met I, I, I've been in contact with crochet societies I never knew there was such a thing as a crochet society or or the jewelry manufacturing. I mean, I had no idea how to do that. And now, I mean, I still don't know how to do it, but I mean, I couldn't do it, but I certainly know how to discuss designing it. And I, I, I love working with other people and the people that I work in, in conservation and, and, and restoration. I mean, I've learned a lot from them and, and uh, I love it. That's my favorite part. Um, a couple of questions about construction. So one, since especially since you have your background in technical theater in construction, um, do you ever take questions as um, to the construction on particular gowns uh, if someone's curious as to how it was made? So do you, you know, when, when you're doing these exhibitions or in this case, um, uh, do you talk about how things were made? And for example, looking at the Hello Dolly dress and just knowing some of it, they're so often in musical theater and and film musicals where there are hidden tricks in dresses, especially of this period, to allow them to do the movement. That has nothing to do with the period, but it allows for those kicks to happen and the dancing to happen with like yeah, hidden yeah. and stuff like that. And, it, and the it, Dolly is a great example of it right here. Yeah, when when uh, when I was first when I had first met Bill and was hearing about what he did, I mean, and this was like the mid '80s, maybe. Uh, I remember going through Halloween stores uh, or or in secondhand and clothing stores, uh, uh, junk stores at Halloween time, and there would be racks of clothing, and I would see these costumes and I would go, "Huh, I wonder if those are film costumes." And Bill had taught me to always look on the inside of the costume. The first thing you do is look on the inside to see how it was constructed because Hollywood did construct their costumes differently. And they, they it usually started with a waist tape and everything was built around that waist tape so that you could put the dress on, hook the waist, and, and most of the dress was already supported. Um, they, they also would do things like, I mean, the, the thing you don't realize, I mean, about a, a film costume sometimes uh, is that they were designed to perform perfectly in front of the camera because you did not want to stop production because the train of the dress didn't flop the right way. It had to perform perfectly. And so they would sew weights into a costume to make it hang or to pull into the body. I, I remember... Um, I took them out because those lead weights have a tendency to, the pockets are still there, but the lead weights are gone. Uh, in the Marilyn Monroe uh, gown trip, some like it hot, right underneath her rear, rear end were the little pockets that had weights, and that would pull the fabric in to her rear end to make it show up even further. I mean, there were all sorts of little tricks that they did to, to, to make these things perform exactly the way they wanted to perform and and uh, and it's amazing and it's an amazing work i mean i would there are some film costumes that came i would say close to couture i mean i have i have some pieces from gigi and and when you look on the inside those seams are finished to a t now a lot of the costumes weren't done that way but it they were designed to do a specific thing and uh, they uh, they learned over the years exactly how to do that and I and so I take my hats off to them 
You're leading into another question about construction um, yeah. in terms of like, are the details inside as good? Is the construction as good as, I mean, you mentioned couture, some are and some aren't, but are, were they made to last or were they made to just be, to make it through the film shoot? I, in the shoot? A lot of them, I mean, I think they, I think they were well made uh, and, and, I, and, uh, but, and I think they put some, a lot of them would have lasted a lot longer had they, realize the importance of these pieces uh, and maybe taking a little bit better care of them. Uh, but they, I mean, they were designed well to hold up, but uh, it was like once the film was finished, I mean, and, and the unfortunate thing is there, there's some incredible, wonderful gowns that has a screen time of about, you know, four seconds uh, as they walk across the scene and, and they're beautifully constructed for those four seconds. Of course, the costume designer never knows exactly what's going to be cut out of it. Uh, I mean, I, it's funny, I've talked to several costume designers who oftentimes said, we went to all this trouble of making this incredible train on this piece, thinking, well, there's no way they're going to shoot this scene without showing that train. Well, you never saw the train. So, I mean, so, uh, and so a lot of that happened. But yes, the pieces were constructed well. Um, but once the film was over, they could care less about it. I mean, it had done its job. It had gotten the t whatever amount of time it was in that film, they were all, it was done. And they would go back into stock. They would be hung because they usually were hung. And they would be hung on racks and probably hang there for 30, 40 years uh, until someone wanted to use them again. And when they wanted to use them again, they would, well, it changed. It changed the way that they wore. In the old days, when something was reworn, they tried to maintain all the original fabric and they would fold in the things and they would seam it and they would make it smaller. But all the original seams and everything was still on the inside. It, they had just taken it in. As time went on and sort of the importance of what these pieces were changed, they would just cut it up and, you know, that was one of the things on the, the Marlena Dietrich Angel piece. I mean, I mean, it had been used over and over and over and over again. And, and the later uh, poor restorations literally were them pouring glue, pushing the beads back together and letting it hard. Uh, that all had to be taken out of when it was restored. But so it changed. I mean, I think they I think when they were first being done, they appreciated the workmanship that was done before and tried to save it. As the years went on, I don't think they cared at all. Well, and also with any kind of stock like that, I mean, coming from a theatrical background, stock is not a precious thing. Stock is something that is used again and again and again, and it's modified and it, you know, so a beaded dress could be cut off and turned into a beaded blouse and skirt yeah. or yeah. something like that. That's exactly how the film studios approached it and film designers and costume designers approach it as long as it, you know, because it needs to serve the story in a different way that couture fashion does or or, or even everyday clothing does. Sure. Um, in the war years, uh, they would strip a beaded gown down and sell the beads to trade oh, for fabric from a, another studio uh, because it was it was so difficult to get the stuff that you would if you had to if you had to rip something apart and strip the beads off to afford to buy something that you needed why do not it. do it yep um a couple a new question for you um how um is your collection um inventoried on a computer or in a database somehow or how do you inventory your collection or is it just yeah. in your mind well, from the beginning, I mean, from the we've been from the beginning, it it has always been on a, on a on an Excel spreadsheet, which I know is not the best way to do it. I mean, I recently have have now had it. Uh, well, with the with the whole COVID crisis, it was like a friend of ours that had worked for the National Gallery in Australia said, "I'm out of work. I need something to do." And he said, "I will create you a a database on wow. uh, on, on a program called Omega, which I know nothing about." And he said, and it's basically what museums use. Um, there are some limitations, but at least you will have everything on your computer. Uh, that you will have a website that you can go to where it has all the information. Now, I already had all that information. I already had all the photos. I already had all this, you know, the stills that I have from those pieces. So my job, he basically set up the structure, and my job was to upload all this information, which took a long, long, long time. But 
So now that things are finally up on a database, and I still maintain my Excel spreadsheet because it's at hand and I can I can look and see, well, okay, where is this particular piece? And I know what shelf it's on and I can go find it. So I still maintain it. But uh, yeah, it, it, it's changed over the years. And um, and it, like I said, it, it, it has always, we always sort of knew where things were in our head. But, you know, having it down on, but then, it, you know, as you get older, you kind of think, well, if somebody comes in and takes this over, they're not going to know what any of this stuff means. And that's when I started to realize, okay, this this needs to be documented because uh, you don't want people to come in eventually and go, I'll just call right. Will. <laughs> what is all of it? Yeah, exactly. Let's discard this. Um, another question from the audience. Um, uh, would you... Um, uh, would you ever, in terms of contemporary accessions, would you consider adding red carpet ensembles to your collection? Yeah, well, that's what, well, well yeah, well, uh, that's sort of what happened when I did the Beaded Ladies of the 70s and 80s. But uh, yeah, and I do, and I have some, because there again, they came up, and I, especially if it's a beautiful beaded gown, I can't turn it down. Uh, <laughs> You're just a girl who can't say no for bees, is what you're telling me. Yeah, yeah, and I and I know that's not I know that I know that's not terribly smart, but then I don't know if I'm that smart, and 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 this is isn't necessarily this whole business has not necessarily been about being smart. It's been about a passion, and 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 that's why we did it, and that's why I continue to do it, is because because I love these pieces, and I do think I don't think everything needs to be saved, but I do think certain examples of things need to be saved i mean unfortunately trying to find somebody who shares that belief is you know you well know, that's why that's why that's why anyone collects larry i mean we always those of us many of us in this on this webinar right now are collectors of some kind um yeah. and you're speaking exactly to our hearts and our minds and it is <coughs> pardon me it is we see the thing, it, it has no rhyme or reason to other people, or it doesn't quite really fit into the collection, but it's like, I have to have it. Um, and I it know. just does and it, I it, It's weird because it has been, it has been a lot of years of having done this. And, and it's sort of like, uh, and like I said from the, I, well, I don't know if I'd said it from the beginning, but I never really thought, I, I when I would, if, if I was to, as a, you know, 20 year old kid chart out my, future i would never have said this is what i was going to do uh i mean i basically was at the right place at the right time and i read the right read the mic wrote met the right people and i happened to have a certain amount of skills that went into what was needed to do what was needed to be done and 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 then i learned the other things uh it it wasn't i didn't come out of the shoot knowing that this is what i wanted to do uh, I mean, if I came out of the shoot knowing anything, I think probably it was that I wanted to be in theater, but that was that's a whole other thing. But, and thankfully, uh, and thankfully is, you're here now. <laughs> but this is theater because I'm still doing theater. Uh, I mean, it was always my idea to do these things in exhibition, and, and 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 I've always I've told the story many times, but I've always wanted to mount shows, and this way I can mount shows with a cast that doesn't talk back. And, and that is what I'm doing, and and I'm still mounting shows, and I'm I'm still I still have that sheet pinned to the clothesline in the backyard. I'm just, you know, exactly out in the backyard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I applaud you because while while I do love collaborating with actors, and I love as a costume designer myself, while I love collaborating with actors, there are times when it's just like oh. When I've started, when I've done a few exhibitions with colleagues, it's been like, oh, look, I can just do a show and and, and I just yeah. put it on and there's no questions, hurrah. So I totally get that. Yeah. Um, a few more questions for you. Um, one okay. comment, um, Larry, if your friends won't listen to you, you need new friends is what. <laughs> um, well, I have to give them credit. It, it's sort of like, you know, they would say, how's your, how, what What did you do today? And I would go on this tirade about, and then I tried to sew the seam together and it wouldn't go together. And so then I had to do that. And after a while, they just got, I don't care. They glaze don't over. Care. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, a question is, um, are there any shoes or costume shoes in your collection? 
I have I have I have some shoes. Uh, I have some shoes that came with costumes or came with costumes. Uh, and I have a pair, couple of pairs of shoes. Uh, I have some shoe trusses, trusses of, well, they're little shoe trusses and they have Judy Garland written on them, but it's sort of like, yeah, yeah, who wrote Judy Garland on them? But I mean, I mean, they are old, but it's sort of like, but you never really know. But, uh, but you know, it, it's on all the things. I mean, I even have hats and stuff like that. Uh, it, it's sort of like, um, but I had to stop. I had to stop some, somewhere, and I had to, you know. I mean, I always kept thinking, well, maybe I'll have the costume that goes with that hat. But you know, yeah, that's right. I mean, it's it's weird. There is a costume that is out there, uh, not put together, and it's of Yul Brenner. I I have one of the pieces of armor that he wears, but it's Yul Brenner in the Ten Commandments when he rides a chariot off to the Red Sea to get Moses and everything like that. Over the years. All of those individual pieces have come up at different times. Now, had I thought, or had I had a huge hankering to have that costume, um, I would have bought a piece every time it came up. And if I had bought a piece every time it came up, and then it was a lot cheaper than it is now, right. you could put the entire costume back together. And that costume must be consisting of at least 15 to 20 pieces. Um, right. And it could have been done because all those pieces have come back. Uh, uh, but so, I mean, so I don't negate the individual little pieces because, you know, if you do, you know, if you, you watch out, it might, it might complete the costume you have. Yes. Yes, indeed. Um, uh, <clears throat> um, what is your favorite costume in your collection? I don't know if I have one. Um, if you had to I take do. one of your children to a desert island, which child would it be? Hmm. I, I there again. It's sort of like one of the things I sort of learned from Bill and one of the reasons why we sort of collected was to to, co co to collect not so much from a purient sort of personal connection thing to a costume but more of an objective view of what that costume means to um the history of hollywood uh and that's what we tried to stick to and to stay away from that personal little thing um because when you get involved in that personal little thing it gets into sort of an icky quality and it also gets into a, a greedy quality which i don't like um I have costumes. I, I, I mean, but I, but to be honest, I do have my favorite, and the, my favorite is wherever it is. It, it's the Marlena Dietrich, and and it, and it's because I wanted that piece for so many years. I had, I mean, it it had first been shown that I knew about it in the Deanna Vreeland exhibition in New York on Hollywood costumes. Uh, there was a picture of it. I, I, and I was blown away by it. Uh, and when the piece came up for auction in Paramount in 1989 that we worked on and we got to dress it, uh, it was like I wanted it. Uh, but even at the time, I realized you could never dress it because it was falling apart. It had been used so many times after the film. It, it, you, you could the, the, it, the, sh the, the backing could not support the weight of the beads on a mannequin. So you could never show it standing up again. And so the five-year process of that happening, and and during that five-year process, finally, after paying probably more for other people to do the work than I had paid for the entire, or that we had paid for the entire dress, I, I, I asked the people who were working on the dress, who were actually the people who had actually worked on it at the beginning, and just happened to have all the original beads, which does not usually happen, uh, said, would you work, would you teach me how to do it? So every day for a month, I went in and worked with them and wow. sat there with the beaters and they said, okay, do it this way, do it this way, okay, blah, blah, blah. And finally, after a month, they said, you know, you don't have to come in if you don't want to. We enjoy talking to you, but, but you don't have to come in anymore. And you've learned, you've learned it as well as the people that were doing it were doing it. And you have an incentive and a desire to see it done. So I spent the next year almost religiously five to eight hours a day 
working on that dress and then it was finally finished and then it, and then it went through getting new lining getting the fur back put back on it and all of that stuff but but it was a five-year experience with it and and it was something that i was doing when a lot of the conservators are, and stuff were saying don't do it you're destroying the historical integrity of that dress by changing it but the butt dress was a box of unshowable beads so whatever i did to it you know and i did it i did it thoughtfully and and uh and and it can now stand and it can now sort of represent the magic of what that piece once was and so for that reason i think the dietrich is is, is probably my favorite one because of the history that i personally have with that piece and uh so uh so yeah my yeah. favorite piece is the marlena dietrich and you you bring up a really interesting point that's a little bit different i think and i agree with you on this between costumes for film and stage and their historical value and what they are versus the couture pieces this is a really interesting discussion about like because costumes go through a very different process of use yes. they're used and used and reused and whatnot and so so in order to maintain i would argue in order to maintain that historical value of this dietrich piece would be to put it back and mm -hmm. to in that case because because that's like a hundred people sweated in that costume before it was done. It wasn't. It yeah. wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't one piece from Dior that was owned by one person that we now have in a museum. It's a very costumes are a very different thing, and there's a way to, like that's that separation. So I I I, I fall with you in that category, um, and my conservator friends out in the world are probably like, no, you're crazy. No, they're rolling. I I, I, mean, I, I did, if you're watching, I, I'm thinking I, of you. I was watching well. actually. It was a podcast and one of your one of your podcasts that you had on someone on and they were discussing uh, uh clothing that were worn by r real people and they were talking about how much they learn about that person's socioeconomic life or the repairs that they made or what that piece meant to it and how they they carried it through these long periods of time in their life and how it sort of talked about the time in which they lived and and the lives that they lived and all of that stuff. And I found it really fascinating. And I, and I suddenly realized that Hollywood costumes, to a certain extent, a costume designer does exactly the same thing, but they make it all up because they create these people who never really walked around on the earth. You know, I mean, I'm, I mean, and, 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 the, the the script dictated who that person was and what their financial status was and what their background was to a certain degree but the costume designer has to come up with a story that tries to tell that background in the design of the costume and i find that really sort of fascinating i mean yeah it's it's not a real life I suppose the real life of the costume is all the reuses and all of that stuff that has gone after the film was made, and Maybe. and 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 the un, un the amazing fact that it survived at all, having gone through all of the the other films. Because I I, I one of the pieces that I showed in the ex, in in this flat, uh, the slideshow was uh, Ingrid Bergman and Gaslight. Now, mm -hmm. that dress was used probably in 20 films, you know, marching across the stage in the background because it was of that period and it had a visual, you know, linear view to it. It looked good. It showed up. It looked good. But it was always in the background and sometimes maybe a little bit further. But it was like, and that becomes the story of those pieces. It's not the person's life. It's now that garment's life. and and how different stories were to told with it through the uses in various different films. I mean, that's what I kind of find exciting now. But, yeah. um, you know, but that that's, you know. Yeah, I mean, a costume has like their debut, uh, you know, a, like a runway, their debut when they're first made for the star or for the person who's wearing it. 
and then very frequently they get relegated to the background to the oh, yeah ensemble to the to the peasant who walks across the screen to yeah, and, and, and as the day and it died green. <laughs> yes. overdyed and hemmed and turned into an a-line skirt and yes, you know, yeah. who knows whatever else. and 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 i and i it, it's i don't know it, the, the fact that as much as survived that has survived i mean i i find the whole story kind of fascinating and i and i realize it is the the true fashion person uh, uh, in real fashion person probably finds it sort of the Hollywood sort of experiment somewhat frivolous but there are there is the same story going on within the Hollywood fashion thing as far as its history and why it was done and what happened to it and how it was done and the thought processes that went all the thought processes that went into creating that costume were done before the person wore it on the screen in in real costumes that stuff happens as that person lives their life yeah. and that becomes the history of the thing so i mean i have to think you have to give them some credit for like making that all up ahead of time but i mean i do think they are very similar and 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 i think that the stories of their survival are are very similar and uh, and I, I, I know a lot of people sort of consider oh, Hollywood costumes as a bunch of frills and blah, blah, blah. But especially in the golden years of Hollywood, things were done differently. Um, yeah. and, and because the studios could afford to do them differently. They had, they had all the money in the world during a time when the rest of the world was in depression. And so they could afford the best tailors. They could go to Europe and buy the best fabrics because they could afford it. And, yeah. and they could create these things that were to sort of inspire the audience to think there was life after whatever they were going through at the moment. And, and, uh, it, and it is a story that is, is I think, should be to told and sort of given credit that it was told. Now the whole thing has changed and it's no longer the same system, but but it's still based on the old system. And and uh, and I certainly think it deserves its place in the sun. All right, so we're over time, but I have one last question oh, for you. Okay. No, 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 this has been a phenomenal conversation. This is, please take no, take no umbrage. This is <laughs> okay, well, fantastic conversation. Yeah. Um, uh, so, you know, Debbie Reynolds, Debbie Reynolds, you've talked yeah. about her a lot. And Debbie Reynolds did a lot in this area um, and collected so much yeah. uh, and tried to create a museum of her own. Um, mm -hmm. And so one of the questions from the audience is, do you think a museum of Hollywood costumes will ever happen? That's actually something that I'm sort of dealing with myself right now. Um, because I truly would like to eventually leave the costume to some museum. At this point in time, there is no museum I would leave it to. Right. Because there's no museum that I think really cares about it. Uh, I, 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 I hope that they will change their mind and that they will start to realize. I mean, what I'm constantly pounding people in the museum world over the head about is that people react to film costumes like nothing else. Yes, you can go into a museum and you can see a script. Okay, great. It's the original script from, you know, Citizen Kane. Okay, that's really great. And it doesn't mean it's not, it doesn't have a historical importance. But for your general public, I, it was like years, oh gosh, probably about seven years ago now, uh, there was an exhibition that I was involved with, and I had 20-some pieces in the exhibit. And it was it, it began at the Victoria and Albert Museum in in, in London. Oh, yes, that was, was here in LA, the, the whole costume. I was to be a part of that. Fantastic and, exhibit, fantastic it exhibit. Was sort of like, I mean, and even though there were aspects of that, on, you know, I mean, the problem is when you don't pay for the exhibition, you don't get to design it. So it, it was sort of, there were things that were, oh, I wouldn't have done it that way, but okay. But, and, and the first time I walked through that exhibit, I was like, oh no, the first night that I was allowed to walk through it. I was like, I don't know. The second night I walked through it and I realized this is going to be a hit. 
because it's telling the story of Hollywood costume in a totally different way. But the younger audiences, and also the husbands of the women who drug their husbands to see this exhibition are going to find something in that exhibition that they find interesting. And no. there is so much information being barraged at you at that exhibition, which was amazing. I mean, that you knew you had to go back to see it a second time to fully understand what that exhibition was all about. And that's another trick of museums so you to get your back in the door and pay the ticket. So it was, it's sort of like, it, it has changed and the museum world has changed. And, and in dealing with doing ex exhibitions now, it is very expensive to do film costume collections because you're dealing with mannequins and you're dealing with a very fragile textile that can really should only be shown for a certain amount of time before it's put to rest and let it rest again. So it, it's becoming an ever moving target and, and it's becoming an expensive proposition. And so things have changed and, and, and I'm finding myself embroiled in that all of the time at the same time at, at the moment. I, I do hope that eventually there will be someone who understands that that visceral thing that happens when you walk in a room and you see this costume. And, and as I've always said, that is as close as you're going to get to that character. That is close as you're going to, ever going to get to that star in your life. And that that actor or that that actor could have been could be gone 30, 40, 50 years ago. But that is as close as you're ever going to get to them. And and that Im immediate visceral thing that happens when you're in that present of that piece, I think is important. And um, that's why I'm pushing to do what I do. And I hope it works. Larry, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. To our audience out there, um, I want to thank Larry for his time and this phenomenal presentation and fabulous conversation and <laughs> like just really delightful. I have so enjoyed this. And by the way, I'm going to be emailing you. We have we have cocktails to have together. I have questions. Okay, great. <laughs> awesome. I can't wait.